Welcome back. Well, Mark Carney is known around the globe as a big money guy. The former Bank of Canada governor was also the first foreigner to take the helm of the Bank of England. But now he is going in a very different direction. BNN Bloomberg's Amanda Lang has his unlikely journey from commerce to climate. This may not be the way you normally see Mark Carney playing street hockey for a crowd in London a few years ago. But it is a slice of how the central banker imagined his life could have been. Was there a dream job in your future at some point? I wanted to play in the NHL, it was no question, and uh, you know, I'm just coming to terms with the fact that Ever I'm Ever good probably... enough for that? Well, obviously, I mean, obviously not. Instead, the unassuming Canadian has had a remarkable career at the center of global economics. As governor of the Bank of Canada for five years, and the first non-British governor of the Bank of England in its history. Now, he's the United Nations Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, and known in international finance circles as second only to Bill Gates in pushing big business for climate change action. We have Mark Carney, UN Special Envoy for Climate Action and Finance, and Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft and co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's hoping to help solve the global climate crisis by making people rethink what is valuable. Of the people that we might listen to on this subject, why would we listen to a member of the global elite, a banker, an investment banker at that? I'm one voice in, in, in a much broader conversation. I can imagine the genius of setting the goal uh, and society agreeing on the goal is much smarter people, younger people, more innovative people will come up with better solutions to or, or solutions that complement and accelerate them. And that's what you want. So I'm one voice of many. Mark Carney was born far away from any financial hub in Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. After graduating from St. Francis Xavier High School in Edmonton, he studied economics at Harvard. To pay off the heavy financial debt that came with it, he headed to Wall Street, working in investment banking at Goldman Sachs. Education has always been important to Carney, from his doctorate in economics at Oxford to accepting an honorary degree at the University of Toronto in 2018. I missed my first chance to be a U of T grad when I left Canada in the 1980s. It was a different time. Trudeau was prime minister. A <laughs> How did that happen? Um, a celebrity had just become U.S. president. People around the world were watching royal weddings. And a nuclear peace deal had just been brokered. It was a more sober time when he was appointed governor of the Bank of Canada. I pledge to do my utmost to live up to the very high standards of those who have come before me. It was 2008, just before the massive Wall Street meltdown that threatened to take the entire global economy with it. A few years after helping steer Canada's economy clear, Carney took the same position in the UK. The next governor of the Bank of England is to be Mark Carney. He is currently governor of the Central Bank of Canada. Governor of the Bank of England. Just before the 2016 Brexit vote, Carney again had to steer a country's economy through a potentially disastrous storm. It wound up being a very public job. Uh, partly because of Brexit. Yes. How did that feel to be that much in the public eye? Central bankers often aren't, and you were. It's hard to describe it unless you live it. Constant scrutiny that, uh, you know, dawn to dusk, 20, 365 days a year. Did that experience make you think uh, more? I want to come back to Canada. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. It was at the Bank of England that Carney saw how markets might be harnessed in the fight against climate change. Now he's writing about that idea. Your book, Values, gets at this exact issue. Play on words. Yes. We value things based on kind of a, a market economy, but it doesn't necessarily reflect our, our values uh, as social human beings. Yeah. The more that we take a view that the only thing that has value are those that are priced, those that are in the market, the more that affects the type of society, economy, and society that, in which we live. 
the example that you use, we know the value of Amazon.com, yeah, the company. Precisely. We don't value the Amazon rainforest until you're counting things like the trees that we cut down. You talked about species, yeah. lost species, the extinction of this massive proportion of species yeah. during your lifetime. How do you value that? We value, you know, the the richness of Canada and all those different species and the and uh, the natural habitats. Um, should we put a precise dollar value on that? And is the only way I value it for its economic purpose? No, that's foolish. You create this trade-off, well, if this um, species of newt is worth a billion dollars, but the plant I build is worth 1.1 billion in a monetary calculation, then I should build the plant. Is that really the value of the species of newt for all time? No, we don't know that. But ironically, it was monetary value that pushed Carney to think hard about climate change. When I got to the UK, the responsibilities of the Bank of England are much broader than the Bank of Canada. We oversee the insurance sector. From floods and fires to hurricanes, insurance companies were getting pounded with more and more natural disaster claims, a direct result of climate change. The cost of that insurance was going up five times over the course of two decades. And I realized then, just in my day-to-day -day job, just the scale of what was changing and the need to do something about it. So he pushed British insurance companies to be more transparent in how they were measuring and pricing those risks, giving consumers a more accurate picture of the direct costs of climate change. And that did make a big change, Would not, and it flowed beyond insurance companies, yeah. it flowed to financial firms. Uh, was that your intention? Was your Well, int the intention was to have the information out there so people could decide. Meantime, evidence of the urgency of the problem keeps mounting as extreme weather examples keep piling up. In Canada last year, severe weather events cost insurance companies $2.4 billion. An ice jam in Fort McMurray, Alberta last April created a disastrous flood, causing more than $560 million of insured losses. And Calgary's June hailstorm, which pelted tennis ball-sized chunks of ice, was this country's costliest hailstorm yet, at $1.3 billion. Does the conversation get easier for people? That notion of what I do today that affects the horizon. Yeah. Does it help that we are experiencing it, that we are feeling floods, that we're seeing extreme weather, that we're, it's closer to home? I think sometimes it does. It, I mean, helps is an odd term, but it, uh, it adds to the urgency of things. The United States also shattered major weather and climate disaster records last year. Wildfires burned more American acres last year than since record keeping began in 1983. This year already, North Texas was colder than Alaska. Snow blanketed most of the state, crippling its power grid. That what's called a tail risk in the, uh, the, for the financial people, it's, it's very unlikely. Well, the tail risks in the past now become much more likely and, and, and almost expected. These wild climate-driven events are becoming the new norm, in part because Earth's temperatures are rising. The more carbon we emit, the warmer the Earth becomes. This notion of a carbon budget it's, yeah. a, it's a relatively new one, maybe not in science, but for in po yes. popular language. That the way the climate changes is for the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And once carbon's in the atmosphere, it stays there for centuries. So we don't get an out. We live with the consequences of what we put into the atmosphere. You can't replenish this budget. And God forbid that one of the things happens is that we get the tipping points on permafrost. And I grew up when I was in Yellowknife on the permafrost, if that starts to melt in any uh, speed, then that uses up a third of our carbon budget. Carney introduced the idea that big business should start accounting for climate change costs in a controversial 2015 Lloyds of London speech, his audience packed with insurance industry heavyweights. The desirability of restricting climate change to two degrees above pre-industrial levels leads to the concept of a carbon budget which is an assessment of the amount of emissions the world can, quote, afford. It amounts to only one-fifth to one-third of the world's proven reserves of oil, gas, and coal. In other words, with new restrictions on energy companies, 
it could become less expensive for them to leave their oil and coal assets in the ground than to mine and sell them. It would render the vast majority of reserves stranded, literally unburnable. A suggestion which later provoked howls of outrage from industry insiders. Were you prepared for the reaction you got to that speech? Yes, I expected a reaction. We can do one of two things. We can burn all those assets that we have, or we can limit ourselves over time and control the increase in temperatures and the impacts of climate change. You can't do both. That's something I had heard before from scientists, but I, I had never heard an economist, let alone the governor of the Bank of Canada. Canadian environmental activist Sapora Berman is known for helping organize the so-called war in the woods against logging near Tofino, BC in the 1990s. For someone who's worked on climate change now for decades, it gives me hope. One of the things that Mark Carney has done is, is point towards the studies and analysis that show that it's gonna cost us more. It's gonna be more difficult the longer that we wait. How do you make those values palatable for people who will pay a price? I think that the common value here that everybody shares is security, is certainty. And those people who currently work in oil and gas want to know how they're going to feed their families. By refusing to have the conversation in Canada about the need to wind down the oil sands, about the need to stop expanding oil and gas, then we're refusing to plan. Call it the tragedy of the horizon. Tragedy of the horizon. Tragedy of the horizon, which is the issue is that sorry, if I may, which is that by the time we realize in the full sense of the, uh, of the impacts, it's too late. We do know that we all have a tendency, individuals and yeah. groups alike, to think of the now. What do you tell people to persuade them? To, this is why you do need to take action today. It costs much less to act now than it will to constantly you know, repair the impacts of climate change, uh, to make very abrupt changes to our economy, our way of life, if we leave this unaddressed for another decade. Coming up... We are in the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is money. Bringing a big problem to big money. Hey, wait, central banks have to worry about climate change? When W5 continues... The world saw a record 50 weather-related billion-dollar disasters last year, many of them tied to climate change. The Philippines was slammed by the strongest super typhoon ever at more than 300 kilometers an hour, causing at least 30 deaths and upwards of a billion dollars in damage. And Australia's last bushfire season was its worst ever, burning more than 46 million acres and destroying some 3,500 homes. Global warming made conditions there primed for disaster. It is an enormous problem. Mark Carney wants the world to think differently about the solution. We've definitely left it late, and we need uh, a host of solutions and innovation and energy. As the former governor of both the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England, he's the most prominent financial figure to outline what needs to be done and done now. Now, I think at first uh, some of us were skeptical when he began to talk about climate change. Stanford University's economic historian Neil Ferguson says skepticism about Carney's role gave way to the logic of it. There is this sense, Neil, that uh, Mark Carney brings a kind of a credibility for the bankers to the climate uh, change story. Do you think that's fair, that he's speaking to a different audience and that that's important? The response was, hey, wait, central banks have to worry about climate change. So I think it was prescient of Mark to see that central banks had to have a position on this, uh, even though at first it seemed pretty edgy. Central bankers aren't known to be edgy. What was new was this banker speaking to other bankers and businesses about climate change, as opposed to environmentalists like Greta Thunberg, the teen climate activist whose movement started on the ground. Mark Carney was in the room when Thunberg delivered her blunt message to his peers at the 2019 UN Climate Summit. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction, and all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? I was speaking after. How would you like to Fantastic. follow that? Uh... That's a tough one. 
uh, how dare you, she how dare said. You, exactly. And you write about this. Your message is really to baby boomers about our grandkids, right? It's, we can't leave this legacy to future generations. I'm not calling myself a baby just, boomer. I was, gonna, I was just going to ask you that. I'm not. I was like, wait a minute. But, but we can't, the message really is to, uh, to adults in the world today, think about this budget as one that is fixed and you're, you're yeah. leaving the next generations with less yeah. and less and less. She's a remarkable individual. And one of the reasons why she's so effective is she's it, it, just the relentless logic of we have a carbon budget, it is this amount. If we keep going at this pace, the current pace of emissions, we have a decade left on that carbon budget. And, and she's right. It was a point also made in Leonardo DiCaprio's environmental film, The 11th Hour, where environmentalist Zipporah Berman appeared. You know, as much as people like Greta Thunberg agree with what he has to say on the problem, they will disagree that the market can solve it because they'll argue the market got us here. Quest for consumerism, the quest for profit. Can we really harness those forces and change their direction to solve climate change? Not all by themselves. If we allow uh, the markets uh, to try and regulate, for example, fossil fuel production, then issues of equity, of justice, of who gets to produce and how much um, don't exist. So we need checks and balances. Once those checks and balances are in place, Carney believes the market will find its own way. Once society decides it wants something, then the strength of the market, the genius of the market, individual you know, innovators, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, companies reinvent themselves. Economic historian Neil Ferguson. If you went back to the international markets of 2008, the biggest companies in the world by market capitalization on the eve of the financial crisis were oil companies. If you look today, they're tech companies. Uh, that transition happened not really because of any mandate, but because of fundamental shifts in the market and changes in technology. But reinvention can be scary, especially when it comes to people's livelihoods. At last count, more than 200,000 Canadian jobs were directly in fossil fuels and mining, with fears many of those will become extinct over the next decade. People are afraid of this change. Yeah. How, what, what do you say to people when they say, I don't want to even talk about it? It's about jobs of the future and, and, and livelihoods of the future. So, and again, the sooner we begin to shift towards a more sustainable economy, the more competitive we are going to be as a country, the better jobs we're going to have. China's now the largest producer of solar. Uh, Korea's, you know, way miles ahead on wind. The two most important energy technologies today. Uh, the question is, where are we going to be in Canada on hydrogen? Where are we going to be on low cost, low carbon, low risk oil, uh, as well as part of this energy transition? And that's the type of uh, livelihoods and jobs that uh, uh, that will really, uh, you know, bring Canada to the next level. I'm in Norway. Industries like major car manufacturers are already taking notice. GM targeted Super Bowl fans with its latest electric car ad. Did you know that Norway sells way more electric cars per capita than the U.S.? Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I won't stand for it. With GM's new Ultium battery, we're going to crush those losers. It's a change that brings jobs. GM Canada now has a billion dollar deal to transform a plant to produce electric vehicles in Ingersoll, Ontario. After 2030, uh, you can't buy an internal combustion engine car in European Union or the UK. Well, OK, guess what? The European auto companies are now saying, well, I guess we'll, let's produce electric cars. We should want the people who are working in the industries that over time will diminish to have the training, have the opportunity to uh, be at the center of, the, uh, of those jobs that are, that are taking off. Wouldn't the quickest route be to agree to stop producing fossil fuels? No, is the short answer. The economic impact would be severe. It's called a transition for a reason because there's an element of time to that. It's this transition that Carney underlines in his book, It Can't Happen Overnight. We saw that happen in response to COVID-19, where industry was suddenly shut down all over the world, beginning in China, then Europe, and North America. And the results were, as might have been predicted, mass unemployment. 
and uh, in many respects a financial crisis that required huge fiscal and monetary offsets uh, to keep the economy from plunging into depression. On the flip side, COVID shutdowns cut carbon emissions last year by nearly 7% globally, the largest decline since World War II. Through the COVID crisis, what have we learned that informs what we need to do on climate change? I think first we learned what not to do, um, which is it's very hard to address these issues. I mean, it's very hard to deal with a pandemic once the pandemic has begun. Uh, and it's hard to build up PPE if you don't have any stockpiles and the rest of the world wants to do the same thing. Acting today to reduce risk tomorrow is, is essential. The challenge with climate is we get one shot. So what can Canadians do to help? It's entirely legitimate question to ask. If you work for a company in this country, well, do you have a net zero plan? And if not, why not? When are you going to get one? Uh, and and what, what's the strategy? What can we do to get there? And if you put money in a financial institution, is it being invested in line with uh, helping us get to net zero or not? Climate isn't just about, it is about nature. It is about electricity and generation, but it's also about literally rewiring and reorienting our economy. Mark Carney's book, Values, hits shelves March 16th.